So this week, um, well actually yesterday, I went and recorded this episode. Now, The Ethical Butcher, I cannot say, it, it's fabulous. I haven't really got words to describe this show without saying, just look, just get into it and watch it. I went to London, um, a bit like Crockett Dundee and his tin of beans, and managed to get myself across the tube to near Wembley where they're, they're based, and checked out their, their larder, their system, chiller full of meat, venison, and everything else, and to check out what they do. It's revolutionary. This is what we need to be doing. I've been saying we need to, we need to do more to help the countryside, and, and these guys are actually doing it. So, let me ruin in what they've got. This is a two-part episode, um, this week and next week, just for your ears. I'll put one out next week as well, and you can have a listen to what they've got to say. But before we jump in, this week's sponsors, and <clears throat> that'll be Sell Your Shooting. Sam from Sell Your Shooting, I say this every week, really nice guy, and he will sell you anything you want, even his mother probably. Um, but no, in all seriousness, if you want some shooting anywhere in the world, Sam would kill himself to find it for you and at a good price. Not only that, V Tactical. V Tactical uh, done all sorts of things for me. Um, the watch strap I wear, um, my shooting gun slips that I sell, all that is made by them. Now, V Tactical is a very small business who makes military kit, but he loves a challenge. And so check them out. If you want something custom making, he will do that for you. So without further ado, let's jump in and enjoy. Kick off your boots and put down your hunting knife. It's time for the Outdoor Man Podcast with the man himself, Outdoor Man Dan. Join us for fun stories, useful how-tos, and insights into what being an outdoorsman means today and what it may mean in the future. From ethical hunting and conservation to new stories to tell around the fire. Let's get into today's show with your host, Outdoor Man Dan. Such a good job this time. Um, so, thank you very much for agreeing to do this, because I found, oh. found you on Instagram one day and pretty much the next day we'd all nice to do this, so it's much appreciated. Um, so, what is Ethical Butcher? I mean, where did that come from? Uh, where the Ethical Butcher came from is a meeting of minds, so I had a bit of a strange lead-in to being now the co-founder of a meat business in that I did a degree in food science and nutrition, and in the first year of my degree, the BSE crisis was breaking. And this was 1989, and the crisis was breaking because we were, there was a practice called mechanically reclaimed protein, where we were feeding abattoir remains back to grazing farm animals. So you had the remains of cows, and notably things like spinal column and spinal fluid and things like that, being turned back into high protein animal feed which is being fed back to cows, sheep, pigs and chickens. So yeah, I mean, this turned out to be a very bad idea because diseases were cross mutating between species and in fact the public health, the thought was that this was going to affect hundreds of thousands of people and luckily it was only 180 people died from the human variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. But as that broke, that was enough to put me off eating meat. Um, at that time, being a vegetarian in the food industry, you might as well have been a Martian. I mean, it was vegetarianism just wasn't a thing back then. Yeah. There was literally, even in London, there was one vegetarian restaurant, and it was pretty brown rice. It was, you know, it was pretty dull. And so that kind of put me off working in the food industry, really. The other part of my degree was very much orientated towards the production of industrial foods. So I was learning how to make uh, hyper palatable foods such as you know, Pringles and Twiglets and how you can balance salt and sugar and fat so that people can possibly eat. Uh, kind of not really what I was, you know, my interest in food was sort of taken away from me really by, by, by that degree. So I became vegetarian, I stopped really sort of questioning that uh, I, and during that time as a vegetarian, if you'd have asked me, I'd say, I don't really disagree with eating animals, I disagree to the way we treat animals. Um, and I followed a completely different career path. I became a photographer, commercial photographer. I was shooting fashion and advertising campaigns and I ended up sort of working, specialising in sport and health and fitness. I ended up shooting 
I became quite a specialist at shooting the human body in motion and that kind of thing, and that ended up being in campaigns, a lot of magazine work. And after 25 years of, of doing that, I really started to reassess my diet and my health, and that caused me to do a bit of a middle-aged deep dive into am I as well as I should be. And the question really, asking that question, the answer came up, well, probably not really. I was very active, I was doing an awful lot of exercise, I'd just uh, training for my second black belt in a different martial art, and I just wasn't recovering well, I was not sort of building muscle, I wasn't sleeping brilliantly, my digestion was pretty bad, and I had a couple of friends, one of which was a very long-term vegetarian, who'd gone from a vegetarian diet to a paleo diet, and had just said, night and day, like world-changing kind of stuff. And I was curious enough to think, well, the meat industry now is different. I can go to a farmer's market, I can go to Whole Foods, I can get better quality meat. So I started researching down that line and thought, well, I'll, I'll try it. And it was very quickly my health changed for the better. Brain function, physical recovery, m put on muscle, lost body fat, didn't have to eat every three hours like I did when I was vegetarian. I could actually fast, which was you know, unthinkable previously. And so I was really in this journey, and I only got so deep into it, I ended up even coaching some pro athletes in nutrition. Okay. I, I really got back into the nutrition. And it was very much keto, paleo, kind yeah. of, you know, low inflammation way of thinking about things, focusing on really high quality animal-based foods. And um, what that led to was then meeting Farshad, who is my co-founder of this business, and he was a meat trader. He was looking to... Um, expand his business into being uh, more ethical and to grow it and when we started talking about what the USP for his expanding business was going to be he was he was looking to move away from simply buying commodity kind of conventionally raised meats from Smithville market to sell to restaurants and what can we do to shake up the industry and the idea for the ethical butcher was founded from the meeting of minds so there's my sort of very strong media background and his meat background uh, and we, yeah, we pulled together the idea for the Ethical Butcher. And really what it is, we are an online retailer, we're an e-commerce business, but all of the meat we source has had a benefit to the environment uh, in the way that the animals have been raised. And that, that in a nutshell is what regenerative agriculture is. It, it's, the animals have two purposes. They feed us, but they also, for us to buy from them, they have to have had a secondary benefit to the environment. And that sounds like a bit of an oxymoron to anyone who's anti-meat, but when animals are kept correctly as a part of an ecosystem, they can definitely benefit that ecosystem. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm going to touch on that in a second. I'm going to go back to something you said about your diet to start with. Sure. So, I, like everybody else, has watched Game Changers on Netflix, okay, which has brought some interesting people out of the woodworks. Um, I then listened to a podcast from Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. and he had the guy from Game Changers yep. on the show, and he also then had a nutritionist after. Yes. And the nutritionist talked about the, the vegan high, where, like you said, night and day. So they had this, you know, they were made vegetarian, something like that, then went to the vegan diet, and it was like, ooh, this is it. And then he said, you know, you can do it, but it's not sustainable f for you as, as a person because of the various bits and pieces. Um, and but when I watched Game Changers, what I got from the whole thing was, if you eat a clean diet, mm -hmm. you're better off. So that doesn't mean you haven't got to eat meat. That means if you ate a... You know, like we're talking about the deer this yeah. morning, the venison this morning, yeah. from a from a park fed deer yeah. to a one that's just been <laughs> munching on the um, the bluebells in the <laughs> in the in the um, forestry commission land. You know, the benefits from that is astronomical, and that's you know where you want to be going. And I and I think me that the game changers almost said that, but because it was done by that side of the firm they didn't but from if you used to watch the whole thing on a which i did on a non blinkered yeah um censored uh, filters i think that's probably the way forward 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. Game Changers was very disingenuous. It was, in my opinion, it was basically a propaganda film to support James Cameron's $130 million investment in yeah. the e-protein plant in Canada. And James Cameron's wife, uh, Susie, is a, very, is a long-term vegan, and she looks it. I mean, you know, accelerated aging, all that kind of thing. But to me, it was... Interestingly, they never used the vegan word in Game Changers. They said plant-based, yeah. um, which is makes you question, well, most people's diet is plant-based in that most of people's diet is plant, but yeah. that's... So, did they actually mean only ever plants or some meat? But I would completely agree with you, and this is one of the reasons why a lot of people who become vegan claim to experience, and I'm sure, yeah, anecdotally, yeah, uh, an, an improvement in their health is because from a standard British diet, standard American diet, which is a mixture of processed junk foods, um, processed seed oils, um, stuff fried in bad oil, all this kind of thing, it's very pro-inflammatory. When people make a decision to go vegan, quite often they will engage in what are called other health-seeking behaviours. So, cut down on drinking, not smoke, go to the gym a bit more often, spend more time outdoors, you know, uh, possibly have a great sense of community, whatever, but they're looking at the health from all these other metrics. And I would argue, as, as you just have, that if somebody in that situation as an omnivore was to clean their diet up and engage in the other health-seeking behaviours, they would experience a greater sense of health than they would being a vegan. And in fact, there, there was a study, which I always find really difficult to find, but it was... Um, a study taken from, I think, quite a decent number, like 3,000 CrossFit people who also shopped at Whole Foods. Right. Uh, and they looked at vegans versus omnivores, who are, they're both engaging in the same level of exercise and health-seeking behaviours, and they found very little difference in health, except the vegans appeared, the vegan group appeared to have slightly more days off work for illness, for the really? slightly longer to recover from colds, flus, bugs, things like that, than the omnivorous group. Wow. Um, but other than that, there was when people were very aware of their diet, there was really very, very little advantage to the, yeah. you know, um, to the two diets. So yeah, game game changers was, was a really interesting one. I, I did quite a long podcast with uh, a, a podcast called the Appropriate Omnivore. And uh, this guy in the States, and he asked me to deconstruct the game changers yeah. and look at all the, the factual claims made. And it's, it's a big one. We could, we could do a yeah. whole two hours on that if we wanted to go down that route. But if you look at, I, 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 I spent four days uh, with the game changers film, pausing it, g Googling, <laughs> researching every claim that was made. And you can basically tear the whole thing apart. And this is what this guy did was on Joe Rogan's yeah. podcast, literally said, yeah, this, this is true, but if you look at this, and then literally just like pulled the well, curtain off and every, went... Every single athlete featured in... The, you know there's, a, there's a, an athlete called um, Tim Sheaf, yep. who is filmed for the Game Changers, and then was no longer vegan, so they had to, you know, re-edit him out. Yeah. And in actual fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger, I mean, what the hell was he doing in that? He's yeah. not vegan, he's, no. he's... You know, even a few months after the Game Changers came out, he was on Instagram holding a massive Tom Hawk snake <laughs> yeah. on the barbecue with his son. And it's like, you know, he clearly did it as a favour to James Cameron. Yeah. You know, and, and all of the athletes in that film are all either retired, injured, or not performing at the level that they were when the film was made, which is Who, really interesting. The bodybuilder in there. The, because the because he was the powerlifter. The power he the power was the one who had Patrick. a mixed diet, wasn't he? B -b 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 Patrick, yeah. yeah. So that, that, that guy is a, he, <laughs> a bit of a weird one. So he, B -B -B he, he clearly made his physical gains on an omnivorous diet. Yeah. He switched to veganism and then, you know. But um, the research I did on him, so I, when I was the picture editor of Men's Fitness magazine, I went out to the Arnold Classic, which is the big bodybuilding powerlifting yeah. thing in, um, in a, a Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio. And we went out, it was one of the most fascinating weeks. Uh, that's so not my world, but to yeah. dip into it with a camera for a week was just bizarre. And the power lifters and the guys who were doing, you know, they, there's power lifters and bodybuilders yeah. and everything in between at, at that thing. But Patrick Baboumian, whatever it is, he wouldn't qualify to be a contender at that event. 
He's not strong enough. He's not lifting enough, even mm-hmm. in relation to his own body weight. So whatever that bizarre record record that it was that he set yeah. it was so manufactured for the film. It was yeah. so unchallenged, and it's like, well, you know, it's like it's like being in the Guinness Book of World Records for carrying the most number of eggs on a tightrope or yeah, something. Yeah. It was that obscure. So yeah, it was it was clever editorial, but just nonsense. Yeah, really. and, that, and that's why. Well, one of the reasons I sort of brought up, we were talking earlier on about my show and how it's I want to show people the truth. Mm-hmm. It's not a case of, well, shooting's good and that's it. Yeah. Well, it, well, it is in my, in my <laughs> eyes, but there's a whole point to it. There's a whole story behind it. And, if, and, I've, and I've said this, and anyone who actually listens regularly to my podcast would know that I've used shooting and conservation and the whole thing is like baking a cake. You cannot have loose shooting now out of the equation mm-hmm. that of built baking that cake because because you, you wouldn't make the cake anymore yeah. because it's such a vast part of what goes on and and everything else that goes with it and you so you spoke earlier on about the um, uh, regenerative side yeah and it was that was the bit that was the bit when I was scrolling through Instagram and I went ah what's this about okay and then I looked at it and I and I I say I kind of get it, I know I do get it because we've already had a conversation about it, but you know, what is it, how does it work? So I think if I, if I can kind of draw an analogy between yeah. conservation hunting, which is your world, yeah. and regenerative farming, I don't think they're massively different. What, what we're trying to do really is find balance in nature. So the, the main principles behind what could be called regenerative agriculture and, and this really follows whether we're talking about poultry, pork, um, or, the, or the grazing animals, you know, the, the, um, the ruminants, is instead of treating the animal as an isolated system, you're treating it as part of a holistic system. And really, uh, I think probably the simplest way of explaining what one of the principles, which is holistic, holistic grazing, is if you imagine this room, so we're, we're sat in a, a small bedroom here, and imagine this room is a 50 acre field and this room could support say 50 cattle in a conventional grazing system. Um, a conventional grazing system would just put the cows in the field, let them wander around and they will just eat a bit. If you left that system alone, eventually it will die because unless the grass is being grazed correctly, it's not going to grow correctly, it's not getting fertilised correctly and that is not the way that nature works. The way that nature works with grazing animals is when there is an apex predator present and we don't have fences, grazing animals live in, a hu- in huge herds. If you think of the Great Plains of America before people turned up, before white man turned up and we made fields, there would have been herds of buffalo or bison. They would have moved continuously. Absolutely, they would have not stopped moving. So the impact on the land was very, very different. What they would have done is they would have selectively grazed intensely and kept moving. So that land would probably not see another grazing animal for a year, by which time it's had its seeds trampled in with fertilizer, it's been pulled, which stimulates growth. There's um, enzymes in the saliva of the grazing animal that stimulate root growth. And then sunlight is hitting lower parts of the plant and the plant can grow more. And then the cattle leave and move on. What we're doing in planned grazing is we're taking the 50 acre field and we're dividing it into one acre plots and we're grouping the animals together and moving them every single day across that land. So we're mimicking the natural movement of grazing animals on a great plain, but we're doing it in fields in the UK. So what happens is if you you imagine uh, 50 acres, it's going to be 50 days before the cattle come back onto that same bit of land by which time the pasture is going to be up to here. And not only will it be up to here, it will be incredibly diverse because wild seeds will have flown, will have, will have moved around. The, the farmer will have planted a diverse sward uh, to suit the land. So there'll be grasses, sages, clovers, you know, there'll be plantain and vetch and God knows what else, they're all in this mixture, which is then attracting all these different pollinators. When you get a bigger variety of pollinators, you get a large variety of things that are eating those pollinators and so on and so on and so on and so on, all the way up through an ecosystem. And the grazing animals are a vital part of how that whole ecosystem flourishes. 
So grasses need grazing, grazers need grasses, they have a tongue twister, yeah. and the whole system needs the grazing animals to, to keep it going. When you do this properly, it can be a carbon negative uh, situation because although the cows are burping, releasing methane and carbon dioxide, there is so much carbon storage, which is a process called sequestration, happening above and below ground, but particularly grow below ground where you're making new soil. And when you're putting carbon into the soil, you're making this all spongier, yeah. so it can hold more water, which means it's both flood and drought resistant. Imagine the sponge. Imagine mm. pouring water onto a sponge as pouring it onto a plate. That's kind of the difference. Yeah. So that, in, in essence, that's what regenerative farming with grazing animals is, and um, and it, and, it, and and it can it can restore biodiversity and soil carbon. And where we fit in is that we're taking the role of the apex predator. So we're taking the role of the bear, the wolf, or the lynx within that system because we don't have those animals anymore. Yeah. We, we've, for our own convenience, we've removed apex predators. And I think, I, I might be wrong on this, you might know, I think we're the only country in Europe that doesn't have native wolves now. But I haven't looked into it, but I wouldn't be surprised. I've known, I've known keepers who are abroad who've got problems with all sorts of things like yeah. that. So yeah. I would think, if we're not the I only think, one... I think because we're sort of disconnected, you yeah. know, I think we're the only sort of country that doesn't have native walls. And without that, if we're keeping... We, and I would argue that a more humane way for a grazing animal to die is at an abattoir or, or with a bullet than being yeah. ripped apart by a pack of wolves. Oh, definitely. Um, and we get the benefit of the protein and the fat, which we have a biological requirement to consume. So, yeah, it, it's closing a nutrient loop yeah. as well. I was, just, I was just thinking off the back of that, the benefits off that must be quite high as well, because that would mean there'd be more places for like bees and, 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 and bugs. That would have, a, that would have a, a vast effect on everything, I would think. Let alone the quality of the meat. Yeah. It would, you know, off the back burner of that, which I've said before about um, actually fox hunting, um, okay, you know, the, the, for fox hunting, it's, the idea is to hunt a fox and kill it with, with the hounds. But the work that goes in before that, of the cover laying and all that, you know, it has a vast effect on the rest of, yeah. you know, of nature. And, and this would only, add, would only add to that. Which, yeah. when, they, when people talk about rewilding, surely this would be a better, a, a better approach yeah. rather than... I, I, yeah, I agree. Re, I think rewilding is... is I think it's a farce, in my in all honesty. Yeah, it, it, it's, well, if, if we can spare the land, there's no harm in leaving, leaving some yeah. for nature to do, the, do its thing. There's no, there's no harm in that. But from what I've learned about rewilding, which isn't, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this, when we have a system that is very far removed from what its natural state would be, let's say we take an average bit of arable land in the UK and we go, we're going to rewild it. Well, if rewilding means leaving it alone, it's not just going to take decades or even possibly a hundred years before that returns to its natural state. Yeah. It, could be, it could be a thousand years yeah. before that reaches its full equilibrium. We haven't got a thousand years. No. And what regenerate, regenerative agriculture can do, if that's the purpose of it, if, say, we want to just look at restoring forest land, well, if we actually plant the forest with native trees and then, say, uh, graze it and then run pigs through and then run poultry through, we can manage the recovery of that faster yeah. than nature will. Because in nature, there are no isolated systems where plants and animals exist separately. So regeneration, really, regenerative agriculture is working to accelerate the role of nature in recovering ecosystems. Um, yeah. It's a bit of a, a no-brainer. Yeah, no, I think so. I think the way uh, everybody... Well, COVID has managed to change everybody's lives. And I think everybody now has gone to the point where they love the outdoors. I don't know whether, whether you live here in London or where I am in the middle of nowhere, mm. everyone wants outdoors. And everyone wants to see that picturesque postcard of the countryside. And that, and that, is, and that isn't just, you know, like you said, 50 cows in one field, grazing it right down, and then go on to the next one. Yeah. And, and I think, with what you've said, I think everybody should have a look at this and think, actually, do you know what, this would work, or, or, has, or has the possibilities to work, because we've played, we've played God for too long. Yeah. 
and it actually would give the countryside back. It would get the countryside back to how we was to a degree. Yeah, we slightly do need to play God in a, in a different yeah, way. Yeah, we can't. Now. We can't you know, not. We, we can't ignore it and leave it because it won't recover quickly enough yeah. to get the results that we need. Um, but yeah, the, the, and the point is about about the land is that we we really can't afford for land to be unproductive. You know, we, we need it to produce food from us for us, but we need it to do it in a way that is repairing the damage that we've done yeah. with modern agriculture. And the crazy thing is, and I really didn't know this until I was involved in the business started researching it, but our modern monocrop type of destructive agriculture really started properly after the Second World War. I mean, it really hasn't been that long. No. And I think it, it, it actually came from uh, some spilled munitions at a, at, after the Second World War, some, um, which were nitrogen based, were spilled on the ground, and all this like, stuff grew, and they went, oh my god, that was like, well, whatever it was, explosives, we yeah. have every nitrogen. And then they, after the Second World War, they started spreading yeah, the literally unused explosives on fields. Everything started growing like crazy because it was full of nitrogen. Yeah. And then that was almost the birth of chemical farming, yeah. which. It's almost like the. Um, it hasn't taken as long to mess things up. No, uh, the asbestos generation, isn't it? It's the same <laughs> yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's what I call a cul de sac. Yeah. It led us into a, a dead end. Um, yeah, short term fix. That really has, has sort of led us to, to, you know, when we were talking off camera before, you were saying the difference between sustainable and regenerative. Um, and I think we've, we've gone beyond what we could call sustainable. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I, and I, I agree, you know, you look at, you know, just bee populations and, and just bug populations. Yeah. It's taken a massive hit in the last. Well, it's been hit long, you know, at least 20 years, yeah, Look, yeah. probably longer because of sprays and everything else. Not only sprays, you know, um, which people won't like me saying this, but the likes of, of badgers. Badger population has gone through the roof. Um, and badgers eat the bees. Right. So we've got to find a balance somewhere. Yeah. And, and, we lo- and somewhere in, 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 in history, we have lost the balance. It's, it's good or bad. And it isn't that at all, you know, you've got the animal rights one side and the hunters the other, uh, but yet actually there is a grey line there and yeah. we should all be stood on that grey line and go, yeah, okay, we need to be doing this, but we can't, or you shouldn't be doing this, but you can't, and, and it should work, but, you know, I don't think ever, everyone's so no, it's, you're right. straight-minded. It, it and, and I think when we look at the food system, when we look at our food systems, when we isolate things, and we have this, uh, what I call a reductionist approach, whether it's to keeping uh, factory farming. And factory farming, when I use that term, I'm not just meaning chickens in a shed, I'm also meaning 100 acres of only one species of wheat in it. Yeah. That's also factory farming. Yeah, yeah. That's a reductionist approach. And in my journey of understanding you know, what we do at the Ethical Butcher, the summer before we launched the business, so this would have been the summer of 2019, I. I spent the summer driving around, this is before when we were allowed to do yeah. such things, before uh, COVID rid its ugly head. I was driving around the country making films with the farmers who were going, going to become our suppliers. And uh, one particular farm, and I, I tell this anecdote a lot because it was such a light bulb moment for me, but it was a farmer up in Shropshire. And he'd inherited the farm from his wife's family and it had been arable for decades. And they were growing wheat, barley, rapeseed, potatoes, sort of on a rotation. Yeah. Chemical farming, you know, yeah, put standard. it in, spray it, fertilise it, glyphosate it, harvest it, do it again kind of thing. Yeah. Not much cover cropping in between, just, you know, really, really, you know, or cover crop, spray it, do it again. Yeah. And he he was converting it into pasture because he's a PFLA beef farmer, pasture fed livestock yeah. association approved. And um, we went, visited this farm in Shropshire uh, on a, Super hot. It's one of those kind of thirty-four degree, you know, English yeah, days, melting, bel- belting down heat. And he took me uh, into the wheat field, which had been sprayed off, ready to be harvested, and it was absolutely baking. I mean, it was middle, we, we, we we went down one of the tram lines into the middle of this hundred acres, and it was the heat was searing. And he said, "Grab some soil." And I went down, I picked up a handful of soil, opened my hand, and it just ran through my hands like sand. It was like. And it was a sort of 
light, sort of beigey, sandy yeah. colour, dry, hot, crumbly, nothing. And he said, listen. So it was completely silent. And he said, you're standing in a desert. Um, so a few times a year, this field has nothing living in it at all. We've killed everything, every living creature, every living plant in this field is dead, and now the crop is dead and we wait to harvest it. The next field he took me into was a field that two years ago was that, and he planted pasture in it. And I sat with my camera and microphone, and I wanted to record some backing track, background track. And it was extraordinary. It was like Dr. Doolittle. I looked down, I, I sat in, I sort of made myself a little nest in this pasture. There was a toad just that I found in there. I saw out the corner of my eye a stoty, weaselly thing. Oh, it didn't happen too quick to catch what it was. I counted four, five, six different types of butterflies, different types of wasps, different types of bees. There were swifts and swallows in the air. There were buzzards and kites above that. Uh, it was a living, breathing, alive yeah. ecosystem. And when I put my hand down to get to the soil, when I got through the plant matter to get to it, it was dark brown, it was wet and it was cool. Yeah. And I pulled up and it was a big chunk in my hand. And what had caused this was the animal next to me that was eating it called a cow. Yeah. And I just was like, so for every criticism of you're taking the life of an animal, you're creating so much more life than was taken to make that field of wheat. Yeah. So if you want to look at regenerative farming, and this links into an amazing article which was on a, a blog called Medium, uh, and it was, it was making the argument that the most vegan item in the supermarket is grass-fed beef. So if you look at the principle of least harm, and you go, well, one cow provides a million calories, so that provides about a thousand human meals of about a thousand calories um, for one death. If that cow is part of a regenerative system, how many more lives have you created because of the death of that one cow? How does that compare to the field of wheat? Yeah. The, the math just doesn't stack up. No. So that's, yeah, that was a bit more of an explanation and, and my sort of realization of what regenerative agriculture really is. I um, done a short video for my Instagram account a while ago. My boss, or my old boss, bought a bit of um, land. He bought it actually to stop the trees being ripped out so he wouldn't see his house. It was a bit of, a, bit of an orchard, right? A bit of a, well, he'd, he'd done a bit of a dodgy deal next door, and I'll swap this bit of land for this bit of land. And it's say, you've got about an, an acre and a half, two acres of, <coughs> of um, orchard. But this orchard was as deep as this room in brambles. Right. right. And it was my job to clean it out. Marvellous. So you I need, get... You need pigs, not shrimp. Oh, we, did, we did talk about pigs, actually. Um, and I just said, I don't they want... Would, they would have, pigs would have converted that brambles into, into delicious food. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to look after the pigs. Right. That was the thing, because it was going to come down to me. So I get in there with a the tractor and I cut the rows back out to start with. And there's rabbits and, and birds' nests everywhere. And it started to break my heart at that point. Um, but at the end of it all, once I got rid of all the brambles, the rabbits started hammering the trees, started to ring, to ring the apple trees. And I've done a video, and it was a case of, okay, so you're vegan or you're vegetarian, right, because you don't like to harm animals. Yeah. Here's an apple tree, it gets no spray, it's got plenty of apples on it, mm. look at the bottom of it. It's now being rung by rabbits. And if it carries on being rung, that tree will die. Yeah. So then rabbits, and they've right. got to be controlled. Yeah. I said, so, yes, you are being kind to animals, but at the end of the day, my job's still going to exist. Yeah. So, no, the, the, the you know, full, full picture, as it was. Balance, yeah. Right, yeah. And that was sort of, try, I was trying to sort of put a full picture on. I mean, I've, I've, I've spoken about vegans quite a lot on this one and on quite a few other episodes, and it sounds like I'm against the damn people. I'm not. I'm really not against vegans. Um, but it's the, it's, I suppose it's the, the attitude of, well, I'll do this because of, you know, the, the, the I don't want to see animals harmed or, or this, that and the other. And I think it's such a lack of education. Yeah, the, the, but the principle of veganism is, of course, very commendable and very easy to understand. Yeah. Um, it's the execution of it 
that that I yeah. you know I think I think it's possible to live as an omnivore and still to live your life by the principle of do the least harm possible wherever possible. Yeah. Um, and I believe that my diet does that yes. more than um, a standard vegan diet does. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and this. The, I, I see veganism as having a conflict within itself, is in that there are two thing, there are two things within there are two things that would make up a vegan diet and or a vegan it is that one tenant is don't ever eat anything that's an animal or comes from an animal and the other is do the least harm possible. However, I don't think it's possible to always do one without the other. No. And we're not talking factory farming here. We're not talking the horrors of the KFC chicken. Yeah. We're not talking... Which is tasty. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, every, you know, I can um, we're not talking, um, you know, over milk dairy cows and all that thing. What we're talking about is the principle of are there better ways that we can treat animals yeah. to produce food for us? Yeah. Can animals upcycle things that we can't eat and absorb into things that we can? Um, humans have a biological requirement for, car for, for, for proteins and fats. Carbohydrates are arguably optional yeah. for our diet after the three macros. Um, fats and proteins are not optional. Without either of those, you die. Yeah. Simple as that. We have to get those from somewhere. Plants are an inferior source of protein yeah and a lot of research seems to be showing now that they are also an inferior source of fats to us really uh, i hadn't seen that on well a lot of yeah i mean a lot of uh, if you look at a lot of the fats available to us particularly natively in the uk yeah. from plant-based sources are seed oils but they're very high in omega-6 yeah they're not that great for us you know uh, the the seed uh, for example our grandparents uh would have had Cook, the, the fats that they would have had available to cook with would have been lard, which comes from pigs, yeah. um, a tallow that comes from beef, and butter. That's yeah. probably about it. I mean, I, I, I remember even the only, when I was growing up, the only place you could buy olive oil was from the chemist shop. Yeah. And it was put in people's ears. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, that, so that really, and then all these sort of seed oils start coming in the 70s. That's when we started having all these problems with heart disease and cancer and all the rest of it. Yeah with the high omega-6 seed oil. So if you look at Britain, for example, arguably there are some plant oils which are quite good for us, olive oil, avocado, things like that. They don't grow here. No. You know, so. And I've actually read somewhere, now I can't give you the facts and figures, because I can't, because I, I, well, I said earlier on, I'm, like, facts just go in one ear and out the other. Um, <laughs> but the amount of carbon dioxide produced to produce, to get avocados in the UK, oh, yeah, yeah. is okay. astronomical. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've written quite a bit about avocados, and, uh, and well, not only that, but there's the human element of avocados. There's a lot of the, the drug cartels in, in Mexico are now controlling the avocado trade, oh, and, really? and it really is, it's like green cocaine. In terms of wow, it's, it's, there we go. Um, and they're, they're also, they're shipped on ripe, and then they're, they're they're ripened with a gas called acetylene. Really? And, you know, they, don't na they don't ripen like bananas, they don't ripen naturally. No, they're, 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 I, I did read this a while ago, so I'm not, I don't want to be too quoted on the facts yeah. here, but I believe they're artificially ripened a lot of the time when oh, they wow. get to the country of, you know, and oh, yeah. obviously air freighted and you yeah. know, a lot of plastic packaging use. So yeah, they're, they're not, but then again, there is a wonderful company called Crowd Farming where you can buy organic avocado from Spain and have them shipped in a uh, cardboard box to the UK. So if you love avocados, don't buy them from Mexico, buy them from Spain. Yeah. Get them in season, get them organic, get them from a wonderful Spanish farmer who you can trace through, like everything, new, like all foods, nuance is everything, right? Like there's good chicken, bad chicken. Yeah. There's regenerative soy-free chicken like we sell, then there's KFC chicken, yeah. you know, which is, I don't, want, I don't think anyone should eat. Yeah. Um, and so, it, 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 the same is true of pretty much everything we eat. Yeah. It can be done I've in a way that is that. either minimal impact or positive impact or very, very high impact. And you just have to look at where on the scale the food you're consuming is. Yeah. So you spoke about the soy-free chicken. This is one of the questions I asked you earlier on. Because I, I saw it, not the chicken, but I saw on Instagram it was the, the, the soy-free pork. pork. Yeah, we're doing a big pork. And, I, and I'm like, yeah. what the hell is soy-free pork? I mean, I thought... 
in my ignorance, meat is meat. Right, so the vast majority of poultry and pork in the UK has uh, Brazilian derived soy in the feed. And uh, from our opinion, as a business called the Ethical Butcher, we don't think any farm animals in the UK should be eating soybeans, which have been flown from around the world. Second aspect of soybean production, apart from the fact that it's grown on a lot of land that used to be rainforest, yeah. um, is that a lot of soybeans are a GMO, which I don't have a problem with per se, except the particular type of uh, gen genetically modified soybeans have been gen genetically modified to be resistant to a chemical called glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup Weed Killer. And what Roundup Weed Killer does when a plant is genetically modified to be resistant to it is it gets sprayed on a field and every, every other plant is killed because it disrupts a particular pathway in, in the plant metabolism that the soybean has been genetically modified to not react to. Everything else is killed. Now, uh, Monsanto, who own the patent on Roundup Weed Killer, will tell you that glyphosate is perfectly safe because that uh, shikamati, I think it's called, pathway, in it doesn't exist in human metabolism, right? It's a plant-based only metabolic pathway, so it's perfectly safe for humans. However, all of you, uh, a large proportion of your gut bacteria do have that particular pathway. So uh, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that glyphosate is, is kind of the equivalent of taking antibiotics. It's, it, it's destroying a lot of the bacteria in the soil, a lot of the bacteria in our gut come through our interactions with soil bacteria, and it's a bit like uh, taking an antibiotic, low-level antibiotic all the time. So you know like you do a course of penicillin and it wrecks your guts afterwards yeah. and you have to rebuild your gut flora. Well, that's kind of what glyphosate is doing. So if we're growing soybeans halfway around the world, we're spraying them with glyphosate, there's detectable levels of glyphosate in those soybeans, we're then feeding them to cattle who have a rumen, the glyphosate is going to, it's just, it can't yeah. be a good thing. Uh, also, it's not necessary. It's a massive carbon footprint, it's deforestation, it's glyphosate, and we, we can do without it. So the challenge we have with producing soy-free pork and chicken was that when you talk to farmers and nutritionists, they say the animals, the, the genetics and the breed, they require key amino acids to stimulate growth. There yeah. are certain amino acids which are- Like, like we do. Yeah, which are anabolic. Yeah. Um, I think lysine is one of the, the sort of key aminos which Particularly when animals are little, it stimulates that sort of growth from the child to the adult, if yeah. you like, and it does in us as well. Lysine is really hard to find in plants. Even soy has very little of it, but it has some. Yeah. Um, it's considered a complete protein, but it's, it has a tiny, tiny amount, but it's enough, uh, it's enough to, to help that process, that anabolic process. However, you can get that into feed by using different combinations of other things. So our soy-free chicken is fed uh, rapeseed meal, pea meal, um, barley, um, and I forget what, what else, but all UK-derived grains, and it grows absolutely brilliantly and gets the rest of its nutrition from the land. Yeah. And here's the crucial part, is that at certain times of year with the soy-free chicken, which is the first thing we introduced, 40% of the nutrition of the bird is coming from the rotational grazing. So the, the thing I described earlier where the cows are in a field and they're being moved around, yeah. we, the chickens are on a cow farm, yeah. or a cow farm, beef farm. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're following a suckler herd three days after the cattle. Okay. So after three days is the life cycle of a dung beetle, I believe. So after the dung beetles have turned over the, the cow pats yeah. and recycled that nutrition, the chickens come through, there's been a, an increase in the number of bugs and worms and pollinators and whatever. So the chickens are picking those off, they're eating the last bits of grains, they're eating some grass, they're omnivores, they eat plants and animals. They're pooing and weeing on it. They're, their weight is very high in phosphorus, they're scratching it into the ground, then they move on, then the ground has even more nutrition, it's got a different type of nutrition and really sort of grows even more strongly. Why? And I... that's that, and then we top up their feed with a mixture of UK derived grains. So we, we, we've managed to cut soy completely out of the food system. And that must mean UK farmers are benefiting? Yeah. 
and I would think the meat must taste it, well, completely yeah. different. Well, uh, yeah, I've got some, so I'm going to definitely go try uh, it. It will, it takes, a, it, you'll find that the muscles are a bit tougher. Yeah. They'll take, I, I would recommend cooking it slower. Yeah, like sl- I literally live with a slow cooker on. That is, right. that is so, my, so, so, yeah. Because, and, and people, some of our customers are saying, oh, your, your chicken's a bit tough. And it's like, well, compared to a factory chicken, a, a supermarket chicken, its legs are tough because it's actually been walking. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like yeah, it's like an athlete. have been used. Yeah. You know? Like your leg, I know you're an endurance athlete, your legs are going to be You've been listening to the Outdoor Man Podcast. We're glad you're here. We'd love to connect with you on social media. Find us on Twitter at Podcast Outdoor. On Instagram, Outdoor underscore Man underscore Podcast. On Facebook, Outdoor Man Podcast. And you can even reach us by email, dan at outdoorman.uk. Let us know your outdoor questions and be sure to tag us when you're outside living your best life. Until next time, be the example.